President Barroso, welcome at the Warsaw Security Forum. Uh, I, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, we're delighted that you found the time to fly from Madrid between London, actually going through Warsaw. I think that's a very good route to be traveling uh, by. So I hope we, you, you'll manage to come more often. Uh, we've invited you here for the conclusion of three days of the Warsaw Security Forum, where we had ov over 600 experts from over 40 countries talking about security issues that are critical for Europe today. We've discussed issues from, uh, of course, the eastern flank uh, to uh, the southern flank to actually more and more uh, about internal weaknesses that we have uh, as not only the uh, transatlantic community as a whole, but also the European Union. And today our conversation is about actually the future of Europe, so uh, about what are we facing and what kind of challenges, what kind of future uh, does the European project hold? As you know very well, being for so many years the president of the European Commission, it seems like a perfect storm. We've seen first the Euro crisis evolve uh, that exposed north-south divides uh, in the European Union. Then we saw a migration crisis uh, evolve, which jeopardized in a way public trust in the EU, but also we saw east-west divides this time about the quotas, refugees, and so on. Then on top of this came the Russian crisis. So for the first time after the Second World War, we have seen borders being changed by force. And finally, uh, to put uh, a cherry on the top, comes Brexit in June. Uh, so we're looking on a almost continental island divide within the European Union. When you look at all this, uh, and it, having known the EU so well, do you feel it is a perfect storm? Do you worry, and are you up at night worrying what's happening with the European project and the European Union? Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, let me just say, before answering you very directly your question, that it's indeed a pleasure for me to be once again uh, in Warsaw and in Poland, a country that I respect so much, a country that I visited so many times when I was president of the Commission, and a country that I've been following very closely in terms of its political developments, because I really believe Poland is key for the European Union. At the same time, I believe the European Union is decisive for Poland. So it's a great pleasure to participate in this uh, gathering here today. Responding now, very, answering very directly your question, we are in a very difficult moment in European construction, yes, but I don't believe it is, as many commentators and politicians say, uh, the decline of Europe or the end of the... We need to have a, a medium-term perspective when we make analysis of Europe or indeed any political development. And we need to put things in context. And let me, by the way, since you spoke about my experience in the European Commission, put things in context using my experience. 2004, 2014. 2004, we were 15 countries. 2014, we were 28 countries. For the first time, Europe assumed a real continental uh, dimension. As Pope Paul John II said, finally, Europe was able to breath with both lungs. Can we say this is a crisis? We have almost doubled our membership. The euro area was enlarged. There was the crisis of the euro. But what happened? We built a, a banking union. Today, the European Central Bank says, in some areas, more powers than the Federal Reserve of the United States. We enlarged the euro area. The euro area today has more members than before the crisis, and so on and so forth. So my point is this. Yes, there are crises, and serious crises, and we should not underestimate them. But Europe and the euro area also have shown their resilience. Resilience is the key word here. And I believe the process of European integration, if you want, the trend continues to be for going deeper, but with moments of, uh, to say, as you say in French and in other language, reflux. So there is a flux and there is a reflux. There are moments, and we are in one of those moments. But we had been before. For those who know the European integration history, not to speak about European history, where were you? Where were we? Where was Poland some years from now? 
was a totalitarian regime controlled by the Soviet Union. So how can one be pessimistic about Europe? Where were we? Where was my country in the 70s? I remember it was a dictatorship from the right wing. Today is a free member of a free union of nations called the European Union. Poland was not, there was no freedom in this country some years ago. Today is one of the most important members of the European Union that, by the way, is the biggest economy in the world, the biggest trade bloc in the world. Still, let's hope it continues to be. So, I just want to put things in perspective. Now, everything you said is true, but I believe you are able to go through crisis. Since you spoke about my experience, look, remember when there was the negative votes to the Constitutional Treaty, by the way, France and the Netherlands, two founding members, not new members. I'm saying that because many people, people like to say today in Brussels that the problem is the new members. It's not true. It's not true. Of course, a union with 28 is more difficult and more complex than a union with 12. I remember I was foreign minister. I was in the European Council at that time with, with Jacques Delors, with Helmut Kohl, with François Mitterrand and many others. But those who say that today is worse than before, they are completely wrong. They don't know what they are saying. Europe today is much stronger in the world. The way the China or Russia looks at us with much more respect than before, when we were just a small part of Europe, six or nine or 10 or 12 countries. So we have to think geopolitically and think in terms of trends and long term, and not just about the news we see in the day. The news you read in the day, of course, are always the bad news because that's what is interesting for journalists, is not the good news. But today, Europe is stronger than 10 or 20 years ago. I have no doubts about it. No doubts about it. By the way, in all indicators, economic, social, development, so look at Poland. Look at child mortality. Look at life expectancy. In the southern of Europe, it was on the 40 years, 40, 50 years last century. In, today, it's more than 80 years. And these are the real indicators of social and economic progress. Having said this, we have all these problems, but the same way we solve the problem of the Constitutional Treaty with the Lisbon Treaty, at that time many people were saying, oh, it's impossible, it's an imbroglio, we solved it. The same way we, we solved the existential crisis of the euro, not everything is arranged, but indeed, the times now are much better. Do you remember? Because I remember well, I lived through that. 2011, 2012, everybody, I mean, most analysts, Nobel Prize winners of economy, they were saying Greece is going to be out of the euro. That's what everybody was saying. We were alone. I was alone in the G20, trying to convince the Americans, the Chinese, the Russians, the Japanese, that Greece was not going to get out of the euro. Every, at that time, everybody was saying, not only that Greece was going out of the euro, Europe will implode, Europe will implode, and we, still, we are still here. Now, the challenges we've mentioned, some of them are from a different and more complex nature, namely the refugee illegal migrant crisis, because this is testing to the limits um, some of our countries, including Central Eastern Europe. This is very difficult to deal with because it's rising, it's, it's, it's um, creating more conditions to more populistic, nationalistic, sometimes xenophobic parties, and this is difficult to handle in some countries, not only in Central Eastern Europe, also in West Europe. Um, some of the founding members of Europe also have it. And of course, Brexit was a defeat for all those who believe, not only in Europe, but in open societies, in open economies. Those who don't like, and those who believe, for instance, in transatlantic alliance, because, and that is the point I hope you have discussed during our conference, security is indivisible. Security is indivisible. It's not possible to think, okay, we are going to dismantle the European Union, but we'll keep a very strong alliance, a transatlantic alliance. False. The same forces that are against the European Union are normally against the United States, against the transatlantic alliance, against trade. Have you seen what happened recently with Belgium, with La Vallonie? That's populism of the left. There is in Europe populism of the right nationalism of the right, extreme right, sometimes xenophobic. But there is also a populism of the left against, it was against an agreement with Canada, what was really, why Canada? 
because they saw it as a, a, pro, a, a, a kind of a precedent for agreement with the United States, this is anti-Americanism. They are against the United States, they are against trade, they are against free trade, they are against um, everything that reflects more modern open economies. And they are, of course, some of them more on the right, some more on the left, against the European Union. So security is indivisible. That's why I believe it was bad Brexit for us. That's why, for instance, the United States American president was so clear trying to make the point that the uh, UK should stay in the European Union, saying it was bad for Britain to leave. I continue to think it was a bad decision. Of course, we respect it. We are in a democracy and we respect democratic decisions, but we are not forced to agree with them. And, um, and those are the two main issues we have today in Europe. How to deal with Brexit uh, in a responsible way because Britain will leave the European Union, but uh, it will remain a European country, a very important country, and how to deal with the, the, the refugee illegal migration issue. Besides that, we have geopolitical uh, challenges, but they are not linked directly to Europe. They are more reflect of other situations. The crisis, the refugee crisis is not a crisis in Europe. It's a crisis in the Middle East, in North Africa. From this, these are the countries in crisis. Countries in war, like Syria, this is a desperate, dramatic situation. They are in crisis. They come to Europe because Europe is good. If not, they will not come to Europe. They come to Europe because here there is economic and social opportunity, and there is peace. So let's not say we are in crisis. No, they are in crisis. Now, of course, it puts a challenge to us. But when we say the European crisis of refugees, the European crisis of refugees, we had it during the Second World War, which when so many of people from, had to go out from Europe, go out from Germany, go out from this part of Europe, because they were persecuted. That was the real crisis of Europe. There was the, there was the Shoah, that was the Holocaust. This was the, that was created the refugee crisis in Europe. What we have today is a crisis in the Middle East, a crisis in North Africa, that impacts negatively Europe and puts us more, more challenges. And of course, we have the situation with Russia, but that is the, the cause of it is Russia itself. It's because Russia and the president of Russia did not accept um, some realities of new order and projects the only power he really has. It is a military power because in fact, Russia is going down in almost all uh, aspects, namely demographic, social, economically, it's going down. Russia is failing the opportuni opportunity for modernization. It's, it's really a tragedy for Russia, for Russia, and for the people of Russia, great people, very intelligent people, great resilience, but they are once again missing the opportunity of modernization, while China, even, even keeping a close regime China is going up in terms of modernization. It's difficult to not to buy things from China. What do we buy from Russia? Nothing, except oil and gas. Because the Russian economy is less diversified than the Soviet Union economy. So it's a case of historic regression, what happens in Russia. And, but they have one important asset. It is military power, and that they, that's really important. And Mr. Putin is using it to try to restore some of the influence he has as a country. Um, but that reflects a very complex situation. And for us, of course, it's a matter of concern. So my picture, I'm sorry it was very long, but I wanted to, to give you already my thinking. And I promise my next answers are going to be brief. Uh, my is, yes, we have difficulties, serious difficulties. But this is not the end of Europe, of the European Union uh, project. We are... Uh, able, I believe, to overcome them. And the trend continues to be for integration and not for disintegration. But we have, of course, to, to, to face now these challenges. Well, this is a very uh, refreshing, positive, optimist view on Europe, and it's great to hear it. But I will challenge you on one front. Uh, yes, Europe has been built on crises, and it has actually learned from crises, and it had gr has grown from crises. But today, we have also a very strong Eurosceptical 
public opinion and growing so uh, in many countries that is of course uh, fed by populist nationalist uh, parties do you remember this happening in the past do you remember that we had this type of problem of parties coming up front and saying we want the end of the european union we are here to destroy the european union what is this phenomenon about uh, at that time some of the countries they, they did not even have democratic parties <laughs> like here in central eastern europe so they could not make any kind of demonstration. So, if you ask me, how was Poland 30 years ago and how is Poland today, or Hungary, or Czech Republic, or Slovakia, they, all of your countries are much better, and they are much more positive uh, in Europe but here than the they support, were before. But here the support for the EU is very high, 85% in Poland, uh, uh, I think around 80 in Hungary. So that's the why I'm, not, is, I'm yes, not pessimistic. The support is actually dropping in, in Western Europe. Yes, because of many factors. Uh, one of them is the lack of appropriation of ownership of the European project, the lack of good leadership in some of our countries, because in some of our countries some politicians make what I call it already several times the Europeanization of failure and the nationalization of success. When things go well, they say it's their merit. When things go bad, they say it's European Union. <laughs> Scapegoating the European Union, it's really incredible. And uh, which is interesting, it is that they take the decisions. Decisions uh, taken in European Union typically are taken by the governments of Europe. The European Commission has only a final say in competition terms. The European Commission initiates the process, but the legislation to be approved, all the legislation to be approved, has to be approved by the Council of Ministers, where the countries are, in many cases, by unanimity. All the decisions taken in the euro area crisis, all of them were taken unanimously by the governments of Europe. But what happened? They take the decisions in Brussels, and afterwards they go to their capital and say, it's, Brussels, it's the European Union that is imposing on us. The, the solution. So, of course, there is a problem there. If you have a company, if you have a, uh, and uh, you are one of the biggest stakeholders and you say bad things about your company, the value goes down. So, that's a problem of ownership. And unfortunately, there are still many politicians that have no sense of responsibility that like to, to treat Europe as a foreign power. When we are Europe, Europe is not a foreign power. Poland is Europe, Portugal is Europe, France is Europe, Germany is Europe. So why are some people complaining about Europe? They are complaining about themselves because they cannot make it better. That's not very intelligent to be complaining about ourselves. We should make the case for Europe. So it's an issue of political where the center, the center is losing the battle against extremists from the far left or the far right. But once again, this is not only in Europe. Look at the United States. When we have a candidate of the Republican Party saying what he's saying exactly. about... Exactly. What's your take on what's no, happening in the States? My, my point is that what we are facing now is a challenge that is, is more general than the Euroscepticism. is against globalization. It's against our values, against our vision of the world. It has to do, and it was reinforced by some factors, the austerity policy, the financial crisis, and so that explains why many people are not happy. And so people feel a distance between themselves and the elites. There is a, a gap. And that's why Mr. Trump, if the election was today, and if it was only white men that was voting, Mr. Trump will win the election. But uh, women are going to vote. Afro-Americans are going to vote. Hispanic people are going to vote. So I hope he will not win the election. But. He is trying to explore, to explore resentment, insecurity. As we say in Europe, in, in German, angst towards the, the, the world. And he tries, coming from someone who says he's a billionaire, which is, it is funny, he tries to have um, an anti-establishment discourse. And this is happening in in the United States. That has nothing to do with the euro or with Brussels. So it shows the problems we have in Europe are not created by the European Union as such. They are more general in nature. The financial crisis was not created by the euro or by the European Union. In fact, it started in the United States. 
but we also felt it. Afterwards, it's more difficult to deal with it in Europe, of course, because we are sovereign countries. And it's more difficult to find a common ground between all the countries of the Euro area or the European Union and the United States. The United States were able to react better. So this is the point. Yes, we have problems in Europe, but they are not specifically to Europe. They are part of a more general trend that is worrying, very worrying. Uh, and uh, I, of course, I'm concerned with it. Uh, having said that, I still believe that the forces for responsible politics for, to defend European society, open societies, to defend open economies, are stronger than the, the opposite. I really believe, and I hope it will be confirmed in the United States, but uh, frankly, I don't know. I've, I've been living this last year and a half in the United States. I was visiting professor at Princeton University, and in fact, I was quite surprised to see how the, these um, protectionist and the localist, um, nativist uh, movement is taking place. I mentioned just recently the opposition in Wallonie in a, by some populists of the left against the treaty with Canada, but in the United States, both candidates, both Mr. Trump and Mrs. Clinton, they are against the Trans-Pacific pa uh, Partnership Agreement that was agreed by President Obama. At least that's what they say today. But... And that's what they say today. But that's amazing. That's, I mean, that's really amazing. And so we, are, we have the United States that, as a country, is still the biggest power in the world, uh, and that has made so many progress during those decades thanks in large measure to the fact that it's a global economy, and now the, both candidates are against trade, against global trade. And, in fact, that puts some questions about the TTIP. But if you go, for instance, to Austria, those who are against TTIP, they're against the trade agreement with the United States, from the far right to the far left, are exactly those who are against the European Union, exactly the same. So that's why I say this is part of a more general trend and a more difficult problem. That, and that's why security is indivisible. And if we want a strong transatlantic alliance, we should also want a strong European Union. Thank you. President, I would like to turn for the next uh, last 10 minutes uh, our attention to the audience. And I know there are uh, questions in the audience, so please raise your hand uh, and the microphone will come your way. You didn't see that coming. <laughs> uh, I see here, and I think uh, Caroline, and uh, yes, and here. So let's start with the first row, Boris Tarasiuk. Mr. President, thank you for sharing with us your views on current situation in the European Union. Uh, uh, being a former Foreign Minister of Ukraine, uh, I, uh, I know that you were tracing among many other things uh, under your responsibility as the President uh, for the Ukraine-EU relationship. <clears throat> you know that currently the association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union is now being suspended because of the position of one member state, the only one, the Netherlands. How do you see the resolution of this uh, issue when the uh, parliament of uh, only one member state uh, uh, is not completing the process of ratification and instead is looking for the solution outside of their own parliament, that is to change uh, the agreement or uh, to find any other solution. What is your recipe? Thank you. Very concerned. In fact, uh, I mentioned the case of uh, the opposition to the trade agreement with Canada, but I could mention also this agreement with Ukraine. In fact, it was so difficult to get it, and I think it was so important. And in fact, once again, we have shown our resilience, because at some moment, people thought that the European Union was going to give up on this association agreement, including the DCFTA, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, that is part of it. And um, finally, there was a change in Ukraine, and we have done it, and so we have it. Now, I'm told that from by, by some lawyers that it is possible to continue with the provisional 
uh, uh, implementation of that agreement. I hope it will be the case. Um, if not, I will hope that uh, uh, the Netherlands will reconsider their position. The Netherlands is one of the countries in Europe, if not the country in Europe, that benefits more from trade. It's a great trading nation, a country not only in history, but today, in fact, a great part of the imports that come to the European Union come through the port of Rotterdam, come through the Netherlands. According to some estimates, the country that has more benefit from the European Union internal market, uh, precisely because of its trading and openness, is, is, is the Netherlands. So it was really a surprise, from some points of view, to see that, uh, that uh, result. I, I believe the result was not so much uh, against Ukraine or against trade. I believe the, the, the result was reflecting what we have been discussing here once again. People are fed up. People are, don't like their politicians. People, if the government says one thing, they try to do the opposite. And that's what happened. By the way, the government of the Netherlands has not invested a lot in the ratification of that uh, um, treaty. And I'm not sure that if it had done more, the result would have been different. So this is the, the reality. Now, we have this problem. I hope that we should uh, find, from a legal perspective, or if needed, a new political perspective, a way to continue our support to Ukraine. The credibility of Europe is at stake. I was recently in Ukraine, it was last month, and once again I, I was in touch with many people there, and I believe that they are making an effort, it's still a lot of things to do, but they deserve our support. It's not only to support Ukraine, it's to support ourselves. Because if we are not consistent with what we say as Europe, then we are not going to be respected by third parties. So I really believe it's critically important that we get this um, association and trade agreement uh, implemented uh, with Ukraine. By the way, I believe that all the agreements we, we approve, we should be able to implement them. If not, our credibility is at stake. Thank you. We'll take two more questions, one here and then Małgorzata Bonikowska, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, and we'll my, take them together if that's okay. Uh, my name is Frederick Lerquist. I'm representing Sweden to the OSCE in Vienna. Thank you, Professor Barroso, for uh, uh, installing this uh, vision and hope and optimism here in a time which is very much uh, um, uh, characterized by doom and gloom and, and this malaise. Um, and I think you just displayed the kind of leadership and giving vision uh, that we sort of lack in Europe today. We had an earlier discussion during this forum on, the, on, on leadership in Europe and whether it's possible or not. Is it why, why do we have this doom and gloom? Why do we have this polarization? I mean, the middle ground doesn't hold anymore in our societies. Um, uh, uh, and how can, is it possible to restore leadership to regain that middle ground, or is it forever lost because of technological and sociological developments and whatever? So what is the trick to get back to, to strong, forward-looking, uh, visionary leadership in Europe? And we'll take the second question very short, if I can. I'm afraid we won't have to. Yeah, again. Center for International Relations. Just briefly, you are very right to say that people are fed up with politicians, with the elites, and it's not only in the EU member states. It's also in the US, maybe in many other countries. You are a politician, now you have a little bit distance to Brussels, but you can maybe judge uh, what can we expect? What pol politics should look like in the future, not to repeat the same mistakes Me, we or you have done in the past? Yes, um, in fact, both questions are linked and I'm going to try to answer them jointly. I believe the reason for this um, sentiment we have today against politicians in general, against the elites in general, against European Union as a construct, are the result of many factors, and we cannot have one. First, that wave of globalization that started some years ago. So people have understood that politicians do, are not in control, which is true, by the way. Globalization is driven uh, in a large part by technology. The biggest revolution is this. <laughs> this is more important than any other factor in the last decades to change the attitudes of people. And most of this is good. 
we have, even in dictatorial systems, we have access to information that before was not. I remember when I was a young boy in my country, I could not have access to many books because they were forbidden. Today, it's very difficult to limit information because of the revolution in information society. But the consequence is that people understand that their leaders pr promise one thing, but they are not able to deliver because the globalization, not only driven by technology in communication, but financial globalization, including the negative aspects of globalization, international terrorism, all this is growing and there is a sense of powerless politicians. This is the first factor. Second factor immediate was the financial crisis that created a lot of anger against banks, against financial elites. Financial crisis started in the United States with Lehman Brothers, but also had a huge impact here in Europe. And in Europe, it created further problems because we, in some of our countries, the only way to restore confidence in the markets was through fiscal discipline, and that was very difficult to implement because it created social difficulties. From Greece to Ireland to Portugal, even Spain, Italy, other countries that are, uh, are feeling the pain of, not of Europe, but the pain of the mistakes they have done in the past because they have accumulated huge debts and they have lost competitiveness. But of course, Instead, the politicians who made those mistakes, instead of saying it was our fault, they say it's the fault of Merkel, it's the fault of Germany, it's the fault of uh, the, the European Union, it's the fault of the Troika or the IMF. In fact, it was their fault, okay? But that creates a problem. Citizens in some of our countries feel the social conditions are worse and unemployment is going up and uh, youth unemployment especially, so people are angry. The other factor is the refugee migrant issue because some of our societies are not used to multiculturalism and they feel they are not ready to integrate uh, thousands of refugees and in some cases even more than thousands and so they are angry with this and they are uh, feeling for their security, fearing for their security and there has not been a consistent policy of Europe. Not once again, not because of Europe, but because of divisions among the European countries. So all these factors explain why today, there are other factors also. I think the social media, the way we deal today with politics is much more difficult than before. As I've told you, I started very early, I remember, very young. I remember when, in the time of the Mitterrand or the cold, there was not a 24 hour cycle. The pressure, uh, on the politicians were, was much less evident than today. Today it's more, much more difficult to be a political leader than 20 or 30 years ago, much more complex. That let's be also, I mean, let's, tr let's try to be fair with politicians. It's much more complex today. And so the, 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 the temptation to go for sound bites, to go for more, more let's say, a populistic, simplistic answers is, is bigger, which is a contradiction in the paradox. The level of education today, the level of people's education today is much higher than 20 or 30 years ago. So the political language and the political discourse should be more sophisticated, but it's not. Why? Because of social media, because of the way people deal with this. And so look at the campaign in the United States. I mean, that level of aggressiveness, it's I mean, that was inconceivable 20 or 30 years ago. So we have today a more educated public than before. The level of education is higher. Much more people have went to the university. But the level of the political debate is not higher. It's lower. And this, of course, creates, once again, that sentiment negative about politics. People say, look, that's democracy. Those people are insulting all the time each other. And this creates a very a negative feedback loop. So, and this is extremely worrying. What we need? We need political leaders that have the courage to fight this. We need courage in the center. We need reformists that don't give the initiative to the extremes. That's what we need. We have some politicians in Europe like that. I mean, I think Angela Merkel has been doing a great job. Really, I believe she has done a great job. She has shown resilience, determination. But I think others have given up. 
<laughs> and, and, they have, and they are not really uh, performing uh, their, their, their function. I mean, and, and then in that case, I don't put myself out, uh, even if now I'm out of politics. That's why, as you have probably understood, the level of my sincerity is increasing day by day. So I can, I can speak with a great uh, independence. I, I'm not saying anything I said in contradiction with what I said before, but I can be much more explicit. So I think we need a new kind of communication of our political leaders. And that have to be, uh, that also have to understand the problems. For instance, regarding refugees and regarding the, so, I mean, we cannot remain, I mean, ignoring the fact. We have to show empathy with the concerns of people. But at the same time, we have to have the courage to show that the solutions proposed by the populists are not solutions. They are very simplistic. But they are not solutions that, in fact, are cre they are, it's easy to say no. The difficulty is to say how. Look at the Brexit. It was easy to vote no, but now they don't know what they're going to do. They don't know. Is it, is it uh, the Norwegian model? Is it the Swiss model? Is it a third country model? So it's possible to unite people around the no, but it's more difficult to unite people around how to do it. And this is the point that we need people that have the courage to explain this. And uh, I believe at the end, because I, I really believe in democracy, I believe that it's the best possible model we have for governing. And uh, the, the dictatorships, they may appear very strong, but it's an illusion. They can fall one day from the other. Look what happened in the Arab Spring. They were before very, regimes, but they can fall immediately. Democracies, they are more difficult to manage. Sometimes it's frustrating time-consuming, political, but at the end, democracies are much more stable and reliable than any other regime, besides being the, con the regime that defends better the, the human and rights and human dignity. But even from an efficiency point of view, it's better a democracy than a dictatorship. A dictatorship, by definition, is more, more vulnerable because it can, from one day to the other, collapse. And uh, democracy has always a way of finding um, a solution by, by elections. And that's why I believe there are enough forces in Europe to, to win back the people without giving up to the populistic or extremistic arguments. We started with a positive uh, remark, we end with a positive remark. President Barroso, thank you very much for being with us. It's a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please.